Hello everyone and welcome to the Self Seeker channel. Today we have Kane Barlow with us. Kane is a mycologist and is based in Melbourne and I'm very excited to have him here with us today to talk a little bit about the amazing work he does and share some of his knowledge. Hello Kane, how are you? I'm good, thank you Nikhil. Um, yes. Thank you for the invitation to come and chat with you today. Thank you. This is very exciting. I, I don't believe I've interacted a lot with, with mycologists before. So what, what does a mycologist do? A mycologist is an expert in fungi. Um, now, it's a massive field. It's a very, very big field. Uh, so it, anything from ecological studies about fungi, their role in the environment, to uh, identification and taxonomy, so uh, identifying species, describing them, um, to then cultivation of fungi. Um, and yeah, you know, and, and I, that's, that's just like a whole huge field in itself, you know, the, the cultivation of, of um, edible species or medicinal species. And again, coming back to some of the things that kind of interest me is, is trying to cultivate um, rare and endangered species. So are all mushrooms considered to be fungi? Yes. Okay. Yes, all mushrooms are fungi. So all mushrooms that you find when you're out walking about in the forest or that you happen to find in your local park are all uh, either Basidiomycota or Ascomycota. Uh, and they're like a tiny little part of the whole kingdom fungi. So, you know, there are a lot of fungi that we don't see. There is a, even a group of fungi we refer to as, as the dark fungi because we only know of them through genetic sequences um, that people have found through environmental studies, uh, but we've never actually seen them. So we, we can't, you know, it, it poses a problem for taxonomists, for example, because, well, we've got a sequence. We know there's, it's a unique fungus, but how do we identify it? How do we describe it? And how do we name it? Um, wow. So, um, but Yes, the, the, the macro fungi that we refer to uh, are pretty much either Basidiomycota or Ascomycota. Very interesting. But before we dive into fungi, I, I'm interested to know a little bit about you and wh wh what got you interested into all this? When did you start? Was there an experience that led you to go deeper into this? Could you share a little bit? Mm -hmm. So... I wear multiple hats within mycology. Um, so I think what got me interested in fungi in general was that I, I was fortunate enough to live in Southern Tasmania and I did a lot, of, I spent a lot of time walking in forests. Uh, and I became really interested in the things on the ground. So which included fungi, uh, you know, a little bit of interest in foraging. Uh, and then over time, the, the interest in fungi just became greater and greater. And, um, but then also, I developed an interest in ethnomycology, uh, which is the study of, of plants and fungi and how they're used by traditional people. Uh, and I guess my interest in fungi from foraging and and interest in the environment um that was kind of peaked then by ethno ethnobotany and and ethnomycology how fungi were then used by people in traditional societies um, a big part of that then is this interest around psychedelics or although i prefer the term entheogens um i feel it explains the resultant experience in a much better way than, than the term psychedelic. Um, but yes, like 
then this how fungi are used to create these particular experiences how fungi are used in a medicinal context um yes so i'm just curious um the way we use mushrooms has that changed let's say in the past 50 100 years mm. how we use mushrooms um do you mean in the context of food or what they used <laughs> yes yeah, so what they used like with the different purpose in mind maybe a hundred years ago uh i imagine the local tribes had a lot of knowledge and knew which mushrooms to eat and for what purpose and i don't know if a lot of us today have that kind of a knowledge so i feel mm. it would have been a different use yes there is definitely a lot of traditional knowledge and I don't think that has necessarily changed. Um, I mean, I need to probably point out, I can't speak to the Australian context. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know a lot about how mushrooms were used in the Australian context. We know yeah. of some, mm -hmm. um, but there's been a lack of reporting. Mm. Um, and then also, you know, and we kind of have to be sensitive to this, but there's been a lack of kind of communication of how fungi are used traditionally and how mm -hmm. they've been communicated to then say white settlers into Australia. Um, I think though, culturally on a broader level, I think our, I think it, if our knowledge and appreciation of fungi have definitely changed going from fungi being a foraged product. So like peoples in, in Europe or North America, fungi are just typically foraged. And then at some point, um, some very clever people worked out how to cultivate a number of species. Um, so the mushroom industry kind of developed around the Garicus bisporus, for example, the common supermarket mushroom, the one we're most familiar with. Yeah. Um, and then, but then more recently, there's been a lot more interest in a lot of the other edibles. So your oyster mushrooms, your shiitake, um, things that do have a little bit more of an interesting medicinal focus to them, particularly like the shiitake. Uh, and I think with a growing interest around that medicinal aspect, the, and the anti-cancer aspect, particularly people are investigating all these other species that have been used traditionally, say, for example, in uh, China and Japan um, and other parts of the world. Now, with the psychedelic species, I mean, that was, that was um, kept very quiet. And I think, look, there's, there's still probably a lot of studies to be done with that. So was there use of psychoactive mushrooms in Europe, it's, we're not entirely certain. And at a certain point, um, you know, I guess belief systems, you know, Christianity, for example, drove a lot of that underground. Uh, and I guess you could kind of compare that to like the witches and um, other people who kind of were repositories of, of plant and fungal knowledge. You know, there's the whole witch burning thing and, um, you know the heretics for example during during the middle ages and wow what knowledge was was lost during that period we don't know um but we certainly know from records for example in mexico and and south america that a lot of there was a lot of plant use and it was very very open and you had monks like sir hagen for example in mexico who reported use of mushrooms uh, by the Aztecs mm -hmm. um, before that was all driven underground. Um, and so for a long time, there was a lot of, a lot of that knowledge was lost or unknown. Um, and I guess then you had individuals like uh, Richard Evan Schultes um, oh, and his associations with anthropologist Blas Rico, for example, who found out that Nana cattle, who'd incidentally had been kind of, uh, other researchers had said, oh, look, 
you know, traditional people don't have a very good knowledge of botany or mycology. So they wouldn't have been able to identify the mushrooms or have a, an appreciation of their use. So these mushrooms that are being talked about were probably really just the peyote cactus. So Teonanacatl uh, was for a period of time just referred to as, was, as another name for peyote. But then Richard Evan Schultes and his colleagues um, did spend time in Oaxaca and, and were able to identify that, no, there, there was traditional use of mushrooms. Um, these mushrooms have been used in, in an ongoing lineage going back hundreds of years, perhaps even thousands of years. I mean, we don't know. <laughs> yeah. This, this knowledge can go back into the depths of time and, you know, and I guess a lot of plant and fungi knowledge does, but as a result of kind of Christianity or enlightenment thinking, some a lot of that stuff was driven underground. Uh, so, but then with with like sorry, Gordon Wasson and in, and in with his Life magazine article um, and his wife's article, you know, I can't remember the name of the magazine that she published in, um, but Valentina and Gordon Wasson together were both really fascinating individuals and both were talking about together they, their knowledge was was equal um but they really brought out this whole kind of knowledge about psychoactive fungi to the western world with the publication of, of Watson's life article uh it it then kind of um publicized like yeah, this this kind of curiosity around psychoactive fungi, and it led to people like Rick and Timothy Leary, um, you know, the Beatles, Rick, the Rolling Stones, uh, and numerous other celebrities going to Oaxaca and then publicising that. So, yes. Yeah, so right. to answer your original question, yes, yes, you know, our understanding, our knowledge around fungi has definitely been going through quite a rapid evolution over the last hundred years. So how did you get started as a kid? Were you always interested in mushrooms? No, I wasn't always interested in mushrooms. I mean, I was fortunate in that my, my grandparents and, and my parents foraged for field mushrooms. So I had an appreciation for mushrooms and they were delicious and um, such a you know, a good thing to be able to find. And, and I guess that was kind of part of a, a thing I grew up with was this idea around foraging. Okay. The fact that you can go into the forest or go into the fields and, and there are these things that you can pick and eat and, uh, you know, but you have to have the knowledge. You have to have the right knowledge to do this. Um, it wasn't until really I was a teenager that my interest then in those other aspects around fungi kind of became more of a thing so um you know becoming aware then of of mushrooms on the forest floor and the curiosity around them and what they were so there was definitely a desire to kind of know who are you you know and who's that other one and who's that other one to to start learning um but yeah but then it wasn't until i was kind of in my later teenage years that then the the psychoactive stuff kind of really kind of piqued my interest. Um, very, very interesting. So, so for the common man, is there a way to recognize which mushrooms are edible and which are not? No, <laughs> no, you can't just like, um, you can't just pick up a mushroom and be able to identify it as edible or non-edible, um, you know, and, and it can be quite easy to confuse the wrong mushroom. Um, you know, if you can't just go by, you can't go by one feature alone. So you can't just go by color, for example, or, you know, how a mushroom smells or, um, you know, taxonomic features. I mean, I mean, I guess this is the thing is that if you're interested in foraging for mushrooms, you do have to learn some of those basic aspects to them. Uh, you know, I guess it's like 
going and picking berries. You can't go and pick any old berry, you know, like blackberries or other things are, are okay, but some berries are actually quite, can be quite poisonous. So mm-hmm. it's a matter of like learning the botany and learning about the plants and learning about the features. And I guess in a lot of ways, it really does help to be taught by somebody else, to go out with someone who is experienced uh, for them to be able to say, this one's edible and this one's not edible. Um, I think a really good example there is is probably the field mushroom. If you live in, say, northern New South Wales, um, it is quite easy. It, it, yeah, it is. It is kind of, it could be potentially easy to, to confuse an agaricus species uh, with a magic mushroom. You know, I remember the, like, Solosibi cubensis, because um, they grow in the same habitat. They potentially grow in the same area. You could be collecting one in one spot and one in another spot. Uh, you know, you're thinking you're sitting out to a nice meal of mushrooms and, you know, a couple of hours later, it could turn into an interesting experience. So uh, why the name Magic Mushroom? Ah, uh, yes. I think because, because mushrooms have always been associated with, with another realm, with mushrooms have been associated with an other world of uh of fairies and gnomes and goblins and sprites and little creatures that live down at the end of the yard uh you know it's it's a very english or european kind of thing of you know the 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 mushrooms are homes for fairies or homes for other you know, critters, <laughs> you know, entities. So they have just over time been then associated with magic. And and also just because sometimes they do, they just appear overnight. They will pop up out of the ground, appear overnight, and then will quite quickly just disappear back into the back into the soil, into the environment. Uh, so there's this whole kind of set of myths and mythologies around fungi and mm. and hence hence the magic mushroom i see so are there uh, more than one type of magic mushrooms i would say so yeah no if we're talking about the psychoactive types of mushrooms mm. yeah there's there's your psilocybin containing mushrooms now there's like between 100 to 150 species of psilocybin containing mushroom. Um, most of them are in the genus Psilocybe, but you also have other species that are active as well. So, like Paniolus, um, Conosibe, Inosibe, uh, Pluteus, uh, Gymnopilus, or Gymnopolis for some people. Um, so, they, there's is psilocybin containing um but then you have your amanita muscaria uh there's also a magic mushroom uh and probably more closely associated with that with that term of magic mushroom because it is kind of the more recognizable um mushroom it's the, it's the one that's represented in books and it's represented quite often with fairies and 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 other magical critters um and it's just it's kind of you know the the nasty toadstool kind of figure as well um now that's but that's not psilocybin containing uh that contains hypotenic acid um which is slightly toxic uh and then muscimol which uh, so ibotenic acid is the pro drug for mus- muscimol. So if you process ibotenic acid properly, I mean, yes, it it all converts to muscimol, um, which is a GABA agonist. Um, it is uh, psych- in high doses. It, it can cause quite a strong experience, uh, but most people use it in a in a very light 
uh, small small dose. Um, other, but there are fungi that also contain other compounds as well that have been used through through a variety of different cultures. So uh, puffballs, for example, in in um, in Mexico, for example, are known to be psychoactive, uh, and there are other species in other parts of the world. Some of the beliefs, I think, in Papua New Guinea, for example. Um, yeah. Wow. So for, for someone who's never tried a magic mushroom, how would you describe the experience? What, what would they experience upon consumption of a magic mushroom? The experience can vary widely. Um, now this probably comes back to the, the term set and setting. Uh, so, you know, like if you're, if you're unaware that you're eating a magic mushroom, if you like accidentally pick a magic mushroom and you're eating it, and then you suddenly have this experience, I mean, you could have quite a nice experience from that. It could just be a little bit of a fun time, but it could also trigger, um, paranoia or an unpleasant experience. So, you know, hence kind of this harm reduction aspect of, of knowing what you're, what you're picking. But if you've deliberately gone out, picked a magic mushroom and then planning on consuming it, the experiences that you can expect are anything from, um, I guess, feeling happy, feeling blissful, um, you know, seeing humor in everything. Um, but then right through to having quite transformative experiences, a sense of oneness or unity with the universe. Uh, and, and hence this term that I mentioned earlier, entheogen. So entheogen means finding the, uh, the divine within. Um, so these mushrooms can, can help produce a really quite uh, transformative experience in that context of, of an experience of one with, with the divine, uh, of timelessness, um, oneness, of feeling in touch with the universe, feeling a connection with, with um, dare I say, the term God, um, you know, but that could be anything from, yes, the Christian God through to uh, Hindu deities or, you know, or even in the case of, of uh, the Earth Mother, for example, you know, again, it comes back to set and setting. It comes back to your own, your own belief systems. So, you know, a Christian may find themselves feeling a communion with with Jesus, for example, or a Buddhist may really find themselves having quite an enlightened kind of experience. So, so um, would you describe the experience as being internal or external, as in what they see around them? would that change in terms of color and appearance? Would they be able to hear different things or is it all an experience that's within and emotional perhaps? Mm, that's an interesting question. Uh, I think for the most part, people experience things within, um, you know, most people have a, a moderate dose. So the experience is very much within. Um, so they may per perceive, uh, you know, and I think you've, you've just referenced synesthesia, which is then the experience of, say, listening to music and seeing colour or, or the other way around, seeing colour and hearing music. Um, but as you have a higher dose, the experience becomes more and more external. So you, you do have the potential to see quite significant shifts in color, for example, within the external world, um, or the possibility of seeing or, or even sensing entities in the world around you. Wow. So what, 
what strains are you working with or do you have a favorite so um i don't work with psychoactive species um when i cultivate mushrooms at home i cultivate edible species or i work a lot with uh ganoderma species uh i also experiment a lot with with cordyceps which is a really interesting medicinal kind of nootropic species uh and a lion's mane species like that that do have potential benefits so um particularly the lion's mane that has uh, these benefits for uh, potentially helping to grow new neural connections. So, um, but in an academic sense, um, you know, like I have worked with researchers looking at, say, the taxonomy of Psilocybe subarachinosa. Uh, and so in terms of the psychoactive species, that's definitely my favourite. Um, and in terms of my experiences with uh, with mushrooms, that, that has definitely been my preferred species to, to forage uh, and to consume. So, um, yeah, there's something particularly interesting about that species um, that I, that I that I find quite interesting. So. I'm curious about some of the medicinal benefits that we can obtain from from mushrooms could you tell us a little bit about what potential benefits there are from consuming some of these edible mushrooms um there's a lot of proposed anti-cancer benefits that you get uh say from species like turkey tail and ganoderma um even i think lion's mane potentially have that as well um but then also there's strong immune boosting benefits so again turkey tail ganoderma lion's mane um cordyceps all have these uh immune boosting benefits of you know just to help make your immune system stronger uh more functional so um nice. some of the other benefits and i and I think this is something that does come through from, I think, the psychoactive mushrooms as well, in terms of the benefits there. Is that the benefits are that you, as an individual, get a better sense of who you are and what your life means, and um, and you, it gives you a sense, a stronger sense of who you are. Uh, and perhaps leads to a, a better, a healthy lifestyle. Um, I heard they're researching um, using psilocybin as a treatment for depression. Mm. Yes. Um, that's certainly one of the main ones um it has other uses as well so depression for helping to treat depression um and again that comes back to getting have, having a transformative as or yeah i would like to hope that this is what's going to be happening in therapy sessions is people are having transformative experience within therapy uh and then they get a better sense of who they are what they want out of life um, you know, I think one of the things about a psychedelic or entheogenic experience is that you definitely get this sense of life is incredible. Life is this incredible gift that we all have. Uh, it's not a very long gift um, and that we have to make the most of it. So rather than sitting around feeling depressed about things, um, that it gives you a sense of motivation to be able to maybe get on and do the thing that you're passionate about. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of depression comes about from just feeling hopeless in, in a world that is kind of 
doesn't necessarily initially, I guess, it pushes a lot of people down. You know, like I think the thing with capitalism is is, you know, like you're working long hours and and the, where's the reward? There's a, f a financial reward. There's a reward in terms of um, materialism, but not for everybody. And if if you're one of these people who's say really artistic, you're really passionate about your art or your music or about your writing, um, it's kind of hard to actually find an outlet. Um, you know, it's a real challenge and, and um, I think people kind of get feel hopeless at a certain point. You know, like I know I, I gave up my own writing at a certain point because it's like, well, how? How do you get your writing out there to be appreciated by other people? How do you get it out there to, you know, can you make a living from it? And invariably people just go, ah, you'll never make any money out of writing. You know, don't get a real job. <laughs> you know, that that's really disheartening. You know, it's it's having that part of you ripped out of you and and you know discarded. And I feel that that yeah, certainly my own ex experience with that was, oh God, wow, this. That's I have this thing burning inside of me, but I can't get it out. I think getting that all pushed down, you know, and that's kind of where depression comes from, having things pushed down in, in you and um, not being allowed to really express who you are. Um, mind you, there are there is also the possibility of there being legitimate neurological factors as well. Um, you know, we're starting to see a real uh, appreciation for neurodivergence, um, uh, an understanding about how, you know, ADHD may play a part in some people and it's not been diagnosed, um, you know, so those kind of things can also lead to depression for not being appreciated for, for who you are. And I think I think coming back to the psychedelics, it it having a really nice experience and and just going, do you know what? I am who I am, and I need to be able to live my life the way I am. Uh, you know, I need to come to terms with perhaps some of my the shadow parts of myself, the negative parts of myself. Psychedelics give you that opportunity to work through that to integrate. Mm -hmm that into your life um yeah i need to fix that bad behavior you know but also it gives you a sense of hope and a sense of enthusiasm again for those things that really drive you that that really push you um you oh. know and i and i think you can refer to there's some really lovely philosophers and i'm not sure if you personally are aware of uh say alan watts and mind you, Alan Watts had his own issues. You know, he had a lot of shadow stuff that he had to work through himself, and I don't know if he ever really did. Um, but then there was also Joseph Campbell. Uh, and Joseph Campbell has a beautiful, um, a beautiful quote by him of, of, you know, find your bliss. Find your bliss. Find the thing that really drives you, that really lights a fire in your soul and and you know, is, is who you are. And if you follow that, if you follow that bliss, you know, like it may be hard initially to do that, to push other things to the side and follow your bliss. But his thing is like, and and there's a particular interview, I think it's with the power of myth or something, but you can see it in his eyes. There's just like, this, there's this fire in his eyes of just like, follow your bliss. You follow your bliss and doors will open, um, you know, it, there's some mysticism to this, but just follow your bliss, trust in it, and doors will open for you. And and you know, 
before you know it, you'll be living the life that you want to be living. I certainly believe that. Hmm. So, has uh, consumption of psychoactive um, mushrooms influenced your creation? If you tried to write something or if you done something artistic or musical, do you think it can oh, influence I you? I think it, yes, yeah. absolutely, for sure. Um, I think it's, it's certainly influenced me a lot in as a younger person, my early twenties, it, it definitely influenced my writing and, and, you know, I was interested in music for, for a time. Um, it definitely influenced that, but I think then at a certain other point in my life when I was using mushrooms, um, it was more about, it was more about the mushroom itself. It was just like, I guess, you know, like my fascination for funky be became really fired up through this like um through this particular experience that i have of, of and then just wanting to know wanting to know more about fungi more about the this beautiful mycelial network that they create and but also wanting to communicate that um and i guess this is where i am now in this sense of of, I, I refer to myself as a fungi educator, uh, as, as a psychedelics educator, um, because to be able to have particular experiences is, is just as a result of these, these fungi, but also these plants as well. I mean, you know, I went to Peru and I did ayahuasca and that was an incredible experience. Um, but to be able to have these transformative experiences and it's like, well, I, there's something about it, that cr a creative experience I had of like, how can I go forth and how can I help educate people about these experiences and how to do them safely um, and in a way that allows them to, to find that their, their own passion. Um, I think you can also be creative in how you communicate knowledge to other people mm -hmm. um, yeah, and how to do it carefully and respectfully. And mm. I don't know if you're familiar with the works of Terence McKenna, but he refers to the mushrooms as entities and you can have a full blown conversation with them and they answer your questions when you ask. Yes, I am very much aware of that. Yeah. Um, I mean, he had this, it was particularly around mushrooms, but he does also kind of have a similar vibe with things like ayahuasca uh, and, and other plants. He, I think he felt that like all plants had a message to communicate, but he found something in mushrooms in particular. He found that mushrooms really love to talk to you. They love to, yeah, um, sit and just blah, 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 blah you and, and you just have to tune in. Uh, to be able to hear it. And, you know, I think if you talk to other people that also have had experiences with mushrooms, they'll, they'll say the same thing. So once they've stopped listening to the voice, their own voice, they start to hear the other voice, <laughs> the mushroom <laughs> voice. So then I presume that the other psychedelics may not necessarily be speaking to you the way mushrooms speak to you um i i think they do i definitely think they do i think they own they all have their own different ways of communicating with you though i mean i i certainly felt from cannabis cannabis to me felt like it was communicating musically you know like you know, if you were listening to the music or if you're sitting with an instrument, you know, things just kind of bubbled out of the instrument or you could kind of perceive things about the music that you wouldn't have normally. Um, yeah. 
Mind Maybe. you, I think another aspect, though, is our own personal inclinations as well. I mean, Terence McKenna was an incredibly verbal person. You know, like he, his ability to sit and, and just pull down all these things and combine them into these beautiful narratives that he communicated was, it was a real gift. Uh, so it doesn't surprise me that he was certainly hearing a lot of the mushroom chatter that was going on. Um, but I think other people, you know, like, I mean, would probably hear that communication in other ways, say, artistically, musically. Um, yeah. Very interesting. I would like to know what challenges you face in your line of work, if any. I think they, there has for a long time been a lot of stigma around um, not just psychedelic, but any drugs really, you know, like if you communicate that you use X, Y, Z, or even cannabis, um, you know, there's been a lot of stigma. And I think, well, I th I th there's something about, like, particularly in mycology, I think there's a certain stigma around that being fascinated by the, psych the psychoactive funky. Uh, a lot of um, academics kind of... A, a little bit curious and might kind of have a look, but then they realize it's like, oh, if they go down that pathway, then, you know, <laughs> they kind of become a little bit associated with, with that culture and it doesn't look good. It doesn't sound good. So, you know, so there's a strong stigma in that mycology perspective. Uh, and, and hence why there's quite a lack of, uh, knowledge around the species in Australia, for example. Um, you know, you, uh, Psilocybe spiriginosa, for example, you know, like lots of people have been noticing unique variants uh, across the country. Uh, I was like, is this a new species? Is this a different species? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, and while it might be okay to kind of study them particular ones, I guess, taxonomically. It's like, oh, well, this has never been described. Um, the descriptions are okay. But then wanting to dive deeper into population studies, for example, that then requires you to say, collect the mushrooms, cultivate them and grow them, you know, that there's been a bit of stigma about that, let alone the fact that there's also like this requirement to get the appropriate licenses because... Well, psilocybin is uh, classified as a Schedule Nine, Schedule Nine drug, which means that being in possession of the mushroom, then is akin to being in possession of psilocybin. So it becomes there's a legal problem around that. Um, so the bother of then trying to also get the licenses has also put people off as well. So. You know, but I think it's been really interesting the last probably five to ten years watching that stigma slightly drop off. And I think certainly more recently, the last five years, is like there's a lot of interest in, in psilocybin now um, or for depression uh, and other things. So depression, uh, helping cure addictions, um, you know, helping with and helping with other um, other health issues um, because there's the potential for, I guess, trying to create a product or, you know, but also having to have a proper understanding about the mushrooms too in a taxonomic sense, uh, in a pharmacological sense. It's opened up the doorway now for people to be able to dive into, dive into those studies. Um, so there are papers coming out um, about now uh, psilocybe breeding. So, like there was one that came out uh, end of last year about cubensis, 
uh, was cubensis, uh, say, a native mushroom to Australia, and and then genetic analyses of that, and then how does that then, what does that then mean in the context of, of breeding cubensis for, for industry in the future? Um, there's a currently a paper in review looking at a population study of, of Solisby tuberculosa uh, within Australia. Um, and there are people now kind of, so there's also uh, clinical studies around psilocybin, uh, and it looks like there's also the potential for trying to understand the, the chemistry and what compounds the mushrooms are producing um, as well. So it's becoming easier to get the Schedule 9 licenses for research. So that stigma seems to have fallen away, and it's lovely to see. What more can we do to help this, to raise awareness around mushrooms and just be able to talk about it? Is there anything you think we could do mm. to support your work? Just I think, I think there's multiple, I think, mm. It's tricky because there's certainly this talking about the therapeutic stuff in a really positive way that we can talk about the benefits of, of mushrooms, or say taking mushrooms in a therapeutic environment. Um, but I think there's also the necessity to talk about harm minimization, you know, that but also communicating that that there are a lot of people out there with lots of knowledge about this stuff and they exist within an underground context and and that's there's still i guess some stigma about that talking about oh i go off on the weekends and i and i take magic mushrooms and do this or do that um it would be nice to see the reduction in stigma on that um, that people, that there are a lot of very sensible people out there. There's a lot of people who are knowledgeable. They've been foraging for mushrooms. They've been taking mushrooms for a long, long time. Um, there's all this knowledge about, about the mushroom experience. Um, and it would be nice to see an appreciation for that knowledge, um, that there's this experience, this understanding. Um, that there's, and that people are they're, they're smart about it, and they're being safe. You know, there people are not just going off and taking mouthfuls of mushrooms and being dangerous. You know, like <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a particular experience. It's not like, mm. you know, I think there are more concerns of how it felt people and, you know, like, I mean, I, it's, <laughs> you gotta be careful with language, don't you? Mm. Um, you know, like there's a certain stigma around people who drink too much as well. Yes. Just like, you know, um, but I think also like there are a lot of people they're drinking too much and they're driving cars and they're doing dangerous, they are doing dangerous behavior. Um, I don't think necessarily the same thing's happening with mushrooms. People are taking mushrooms in a respectful way to be able to learn about themselves, to be able to, you know, maybe as a means of non-clinical use to treat their own, their own depression, um, to work on their own you know, their own shadow side and, and to, I guess, but also to, to refresh that sense of unity with the universe, <laughs> you know, it, because like having a transformative experience and trying to integrate it, you know, it doesn't, it's, it's kind of a subtle shift. You know, there's, 
there's also the potential to fall back into the world, to fall back into your nine to five job, the pressures of what's going on around you, you know, like your work, your family, other things in life. It's, it becomes easy to forget those things. Yeah. Those that, you know, that core thing that you, that you do want. So, you know, you can be working on that while also doing your nine to five. Yeah. Um, but it's also easy to forget things. And and so people do, they go off and they will, you know, go foraging, find some mushrooms, <laughs> read those as a way just to remind themselves of like, okay, you know, I have to do my nine to five, but this can also help me to re-engage with that thing that really drives me. I feel in a way they might be the opposite of what alcohol does. Um, when you want to bury your problems, you may go and have a drink. But mushrooms, you have them, you almost discover the problems that are there within, oh, within yourself. And you uncover yes. them and they're right in front of you. And now you've got to work yeah. on them. Mm -hmm. So I, I just think um, mushrooms can be beneficial used in the right setting, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Look, I think any drug used in the right way, be it alcohol, cannabis, um, you know, numerous, numerous other compounds. I mean, they can all be beneficial in their own way when treated respectfully and with moderation. Um, you know, like you can go to, uh, who's, who's, uh, Thomas de Quincey, for example, was a was a writer um, in the middle of the eighteen hundreds. Or uh, no, early eighteen hundreds. Sorry, <laughs> early eighteen hundreds. He was doing lots of laudanum, and he was having some very very interesting experiences. Um, mind you, I think he, he, by today's standards, he was probably quite addicted to that. But you know, but he was finding his own inner you know, demons, and he was working with that. Um, um, and then you had people like William Burroughs, who was also, you know, he, he wrote Junkie. You know, he was quite open about his problems with, with heroin. Um, but then he also elicited just some of the amazing experiences that he had with that compound. Um, you know, and while it was problematic in some senses, there were other benefits that he experienced it, from it. Um, yeah can i mean sorry yeah no ahead. that's go go on <laughs> yeah i was just wondering can someone get addicted to mushrooms people yeah people can help have problematic relationships with mushrooms um i think some people do find a sense of escape in that being in an altered state of an of awareness mm -hmm. they they can find comfort in that uh so there's probably a little bit of a like a dopamine drive to want to return to that state over and over again uh and it has been reported that i i wouldn't necessarily i, I guess it is addiction in the formal sense but it's probably just more like people just want to return to that comfort space um but it can be problematic and people can um, become depressed because of overuse of mushrooms. So it's certainly something to point out, you know, while there are all these benefits, you know, we're not used in, in moderation. We're not used in the right way. It can lead to, it can lead to ex exacerbation of, of problems. So depression, anxiety, um, there are cases of people uh, leading to kind of suicidal thoughts in some cases. So that it's definitely worth noting. Um, yeah. But then there's also cases with psychedelics of, you know, and, and like if you go to do therapy or if you get signed up for a clinical trial, uh, they're going to assess you for 
uh, other potential uh, issues that you may have. You know, like you may have a predisposition, for example, to psychosis, uh, in which case that may be flagged as a, as a potential problem. Um, you know, and I guess that, that's something I've had in my own, a personal experience I've had in my own life is, is I've had a couple of friends who, who were predisposed, predisposed, sorry, I have a bit of a stutter, predisposed to psychosis um, and, and have had then very negative experiences mm -hmm. from that. So it sounds like it's not for everyone. We need to get assessed no. before yeah. we consider taking them. Mm -hmm. That's important. So okay. It is. Mm -hmm. But it's also like, is, at what stage in your life are you as well? I mean, generally that predisposition is, is more apparent in your teenage years, um, you know, early adulthood, um, by, you know, later adult or mid, <laughs> middle age. You know, the, there's less of that. So merely in, in, I guess, those cases, you know, that's why they have the screenings. So, you know, it still may cause a problem. I think, though, if anyone has never taken them and is curious about taking them, I think it's little steps is my mm. advice. Is... And the dosage matters, like the amount you take. Yeah. Don't yeah. dive in. Don't do the Terence McKenna five grams in silent darkness straight away. <laughs> you know, I think, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of harm minimization, the safe route is, is little steps, you know, take little doses and, and just see how you go. Um, I mean, another factor as well is, is spiritual emergency is that if you do have a strong dose, you may have a, a very profound psychedelic experience uh, that, that may leave you completely flawed, uh, but also uh, flawed as in uh, is just overwhelmed, <laughs> not, not as in a flawed individual, but just completely overwhelmed. Um, and, but you also may be it's like my life is a lie and um, want to, you know, leave your job and sell your house, buy a car and just, you know, hit, do a road trip or <laughs> go become a painter or, you know, there, there's kind of like a, just a, a bit of a kind of advice of just like, if you do have a transformative experience, try to integrate it as best you can, um, you know, but don't go rushing into anything. Don't, you know, quit your job and go off and become a musician overnight. You know, take your time with it. You know, it's great to find your bliss, but little steps. <laughs> yes, I, I I feel there are a lot of misconceptions about mushrooms and psychedelics. So, just more educational events that create awareness and yeah, um, have uh, presentations from knowledgeable. Um, academic researchers like yourself would, would help the cause. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have any activities or events coming up in the near future that you're looking forward to? Uh, yes. Yeah. So, um, I think, ah, oh, so there's a mushroom festival that's happening in Victoria, mm -hmm. uh, that I'm a part of. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Um, sadly it's concurrent with your own event that you're holding um but yes no i i'm preparing a presentation for you and your event uh, i'm excited to be a part of that i'm looking forward to uh then being able to watch some of the other content that comes out of that afterwards uh it's just unfortunate that it overlaps um but uh yeah no i will be i will be talking about a paper that i was part of uh, recently, the the Cubensis paper that that I kind of mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. uh, where I'm talking about the results from that Cubensis paper and wow. what that what that then means to um, the future of for Cubensis cultivation uh, in Australia and overseas as well. 
um, your talk in for your event. I'll be talking about Amadina muscaria. It, it's such a fascinating mushroom, um, and um, and I guess hang on to just shift things around slightly. I'm also will be speaking at Nimbin Mardi Gras in Northern oh. New South Wales this year. Um, and when I was there last year, I did a, I did a talk on the diversity of, uh, psilocybin containing mushrooms in Australia. Um, but what was really interesting was during the Q and A was all the questions around Amadina muscaria, um, because it's, it's, there's a lot of interest around it. Um, you know, it's been, uh, it has a lot of stigma. There's this word again, stigma. Amadeus muscaria has a lot of stigma because it's just been referred to as a poisonous mushroom for so long. Um, and yes, it does contain some poisons in but very, very minor amounts. Uh, there's muscarine, which is poisonous, but Amadeus muscaria contains such a minuscule amount of muscarine that it's actually not a problem. Yes. Um, and then there is ibotenic acid, which um, is known to be um, poisonous to or toxic, toxic in to, to neurons. But the particular study that people that that comes from, they were using pretty high concentration ibotenic acid, and they were applying it directly to 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 um to brain cells in culture and of course it's going to be toxic you know like it might have be slightly toxic but you're injecting it directly as is yeah i'm not surprised um uh, that i had the results that it did you know but if you treat Amanita muscaria properly. If you dry it out thoroughly, or if you do the proper processing methods, uh, there's nothing to say that you you can't convert all that ibotenic acid into muscimol. Muscimol's, you know, at high doses, yes, it results in a, a particularly delirium style experience. But in lower doses, it's actually quite pleasant. So, wow! Um, but I will be talking about that in more detail. <laughs> brilliant talk for you at your event so. thank you yes so uh, it's called using plants as medicine and it's a four-day event that's being held in brisbane and mm. i'm so grateful that uh, you'll be joining us and presenting on amanita muscaria for us um, what does it look like the, the mushroom amanita muscaria uh it is um it has a it has a large red cap with white spots uh, it has this beautiful white stem uh and it has a really lovely frilly white um annulus um or skirt other people refer to the annulus as a skirt so it's it's kind of the archetypal mushroom in a lot of ways. It mm. it's um you'll see it in a lot of psychedelic art, you will see it in a lot of literature that refers to uh magic and mythology. Mm -hmm. Uh it turns up in fairy tales, mm -hmm. in particularly like in the illustrations. Mm -hmm. Um and when you look through a lot of modern children's books, uh, when they talk about mushrooms out in the forest, or it's it, they're quite often the, the mushrooms represented, uh, not necessarily as a red and red mushroom with white spots, but perhaps as a purple mushroom with blue spots, or oh. you know, like they'll they'll mix the colours up somewhat. Right. Um, but because of that archetypal association of the cap with the spots. Um, yeah. Wow. It's, it's a beautiful mushroom. Um, I, I think it's a gorgeous, pretty thick mushroom and I love finding them. And, um, yeah, it's, mm. so I'm sorry. I don't have an example. With me. <laughs> I mean, we're kind of at the ends of summer here and 
and Amanita muscaria is typically an autumn mushroom. Okay. Um, so, and it's, it's mycorrhizal as well. So it grows in association with, with a tree, a tree host. Oh, uh, and it's the change of season. It's the tree becoming deciduous that then triggers uh, the mushroom growth. Yeah. So, wow. Yeah. So you'll you'll find them, and that, and that adds to their, I think, their beauty as well. Is that they're yeah. sitting amongst these, you know, these beautiful kind of brown and yellow leaves, and and here is this vibrant red cap and these dots and this beautiful white stem. Um, you know, like you, it's just no surprise that they're considered magic. You know, like just what a thing of beauty in, in a time of when things are in a in a period of decay mm. it looks like decay i see so do you take photographs as part of your work of the mushrooms uh i do i love taking photographs of of mushrooms mm -hmm. um i do take a lot of photographs of my work i take a lot of film footage as well mm -hmm. um i mean i work in fungi education mm -hmm. uh and so that is across uh typically most of my education work is around uh cultivation so teaching people how to grow their own edible mushrooms or medicinal mushrooms um sadly not the <laughs> not the psychoactive <laughs> ones then there's these legislations mm. that we need to be kind of respectful yeah. of for the time being um but then I also do a lot of harm minimization education as well. So, uh, you know, and I've done talks around Amadeus and Muscaria, and I've done talks around uh, various psilocybin containing species. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I typically work with a group called Entheogenesis Australis. Okay. Uh, I'm the education officer for them. So that puts me in the position of communicating a fair bit of harm minimization information around around particularly around fungi which is incredibly important yeah so you're doing a great job i'm sure thank yeah. you <laughs> I'm well, really... well i mean i've i've almost been caught out myself with almost collecting poisonous mushrooms uh, I'm aware of various people who get poisoned uh, every year. I've been in positions of where I've had to help work out what the mushroom is that someone's taken uh, and then been advised them what to do. Uh, wow. You know, it's like, oh, you're okay. <laughs> Don't need to panic. You can sit and relax. Uh, but then also been in cases of just like, yeah, you need to, you need to probably seek medical advice for, what you've done <laughs> so which is hard it's hard and it's challenging and that's been a big motivation for me to try to communicate as best i can uh knowledge around foraging and and how to correctly identify the the right species so yes um, and i and i certainly hope that i've i've helped people with their understanding about the species of uh what to collect and what not to collect Wow. I'm absolutely looking forward to your presentation at the event and um, your work around Amanita Muscaria. So I hope uh... I'm, I'm excited to have been invited by yourself to to do this and I'm excited to talk for, for your audience. Um, yeah. And this event will be uh, live streamed so people in other countries can watch it as well. Mm -hmm. So how how do people um, get in touch with you or keep track of your work if they want to follow you? Do you have any links you can you know, share with us? Uh, yeah, I have a website. I have a website, uh, gorillamycology.com. Um, I also have an Instagram, Gorilla Mycology. Uh, now that's gorilla as in as in Che Guevara, <laughs> and not gorilla as in as in the big the ape. So. Okay. Uh, yeah. G U E double uh, R I double L A mycology M Y 
M-Y-C-O-L-O-G-Y. Thank you. Uh, so people can uh, get in touch with me through my website. There's a contact form. Um, there's, like I said, my Instagram. So feel free to follow me and, and feel free to message me. Um, I also do work with Entheogenesis Australis. Uh, and that's entheogenesis.org is, is where you're likely to find material. Uh, and they also have a YouTube channel, Entheo TV, okay. that, that has um, material that I've done for them as well. Very interesting. I shall make sure I follow that and put the links for, uh, for them in the description of this video. So we have come to the end of this uh, video of this wonderful conversation with you. Do you have any last words for our viewers, Kane? Uh, last words is be safe, be safe, be respectful. Uh, if you're foraging for mushrooms, my advice is to learn about them, research about them beforehand, but also research the research what you want to collect, but also research the ones that you don't want to collect. Um, you know, having understanding of, of the desirable fungi and the poisonous fungi it helps a lot. Um, and I think in terms of if you're interested in antigens, it's about, again, research, uh, doing reading, taking your time um, and going slow. Don't just dive in the deep end because yeah. who knows, maybe you'll discover more than you really wanted to in the first <laughs> place. Go slow, be gentle. Um, yeah. And in some ways it's, it's, there's also a sense of, I, th I think it's a bit of a kind of psychedelic thing is, is, is these plants, these fungi will find you rather than the other way around you know they seem to come along at the right time that's right for you so thank you that's it i guess set and setting <laughs> oh yes set and setting and and things like that invaluable advice in thank you very much for that um i hope to see you in person someday yeah definitely <laughs> looking forward to meeting you in person um yeah. and again thank you again for the invite to come along and, and chat with you today this has been lovely thank you